Hello and welcome to our mini review of the CCRN review. Today we're going to talk about one topic that's very important when you're talking about critical care nursing and that is oxygen delivery. Oxygen delivery is made up of many different components and as the diagram illustrates, if we start at the bottom, we're starting out with what makes up our cardiac output. Our stroke volume, our heart rate, make up cardiac output. And you've all heard that probably before at some point in time, that stroke volume times heart rate equals cardiac output. That, that we've heard that uh, at some point in time in our careers. Well, what makes up stroke volume is preload, contractility, and afterload. So we need to optimize those things if we're going to have an adequate stroke volume and we need to have an adequate stroke volume and an adequate heart rate. And heart rate's too fast, too slow. It's going to affect our cardiac output. Cardiac output then is just one of the components that is necessary to get to oxygen delivery. We also have to have an adequate SVR, systemic vascular resistance, so that it maintains a blood pressure that will get those little oxygen molecules out there into the periphery and have an adequate perfusion pressure in the organs in order to be able to maintain perfusion. At the same time, we also need to have an adequate hemoglobin level to carry the oxygen. And we need to be able to attach that oxygen to the hemoglobin. So all of those components all come together in oxygen delivery. When we have a patient who does not have enough oxygen getting to the tissues of their body, it's important that we're looking at all of these different components rather than just one or two. Oxygen delivery, as we said before, is dependent upon cardiac output. And cardiac output is the product of stroke volume times heart rate. Stroke volume is made up of preload, contractility, and afterload. So we would have to optimize those components in addition to optimizing our heart rate in order just to be able to maintain the cardiac output piece, which is just one piece of that big puzzle of oxygen delivery. So let's take a look at this diagram here. This is a diagram uh, illustrating our hemodynamics. The first component of hemodynamics is our preload, and preload is the volume of blood that is coming back to the heart. Specifically, the left side of the heart is what we're concerned with, but the volume of blood that's coming back. So if our patient is hypovolemic, that's going to affect our cardiac output. If the patient is hypervolemic, they have too much volume on board, that will also affect our cardiac output. So we have to make sure that the volume is appropriate in order to be able to get enough blood to the heart to maintain cardiac output in order to be able to get that oxygen to the tissue. The next component that we have to keep in mind is contractility. This is the heart's ability to be able to contract fully to get as much blood as possible out into the periphery. Usually that's 70% of the blood that's in the ventricle that gets pumped out. We call that our ejection fraction. So that piece needs to be optimized as well. If you have a patient who has heart failure and only has maybe a fraction of that cardiac output, it's going to definitely affect our ability to be able to get oxygen to the tissues. And we would need to optimize our contractility if we're going to be able to get enough oxygen to the tissues of the body. The third component then is afterload. Afterload is the resistance that the heart has to pump against. This is caused by the arterial vasculature. So again, we have to optimize that as well. If that arterial vasculature is all clamped down because the sympathetic nervous system is working as a compensatory mechanism to a low cardiac output state, that is going to further decrease our circulation to the tissue. Imagine all of those arteries getting clamped down. It's like turning the faucet down. We have less flow. Oxygen delivery obviously is also dependent upon our hemoglobin. We have to have an adequate amount of hemoglobin. How many of your patients are anemic? 
Okay, so a lot of our patients are going to have difficulty getting enough oxygen to the tissues because they don't have enough hemoglobin. In addition to having the hemoglobin, our patient also needs to be able to connect the oxygen to the hemoglobin. Now, many of you may remember back in time and, and think back to uh, maybe in school when you learned about the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. And there are three components that affect that oxy dis oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. And, and what that curve is telling us about is it's telling us about oxygen's ability to be able to bind to hemoglobin. Three things affect that. Our carbon dioxide level, fever, and body temperature. So we'll need to optimize those three things too if we're going to be able to bind oxygen to hemoglobin. As mentioned previously, oxygen delivery is also dependent upon our blood pressure. Blood pressure is made up of cardiac output, that's what makes up our systolic, and our systemic vascular resistance, which makes up our diastolic pressure in the blood pressure. If the blood pressure is not adequate, we're not going to have enough blood pressure, enough pressure to push that blood through those small little vessels out there in the periphery. So let's take a look at an example here and put it all together. Your patient is in cardiogenic shock with the following assessment findings. He has a blood pressure of 84 over 60, a heart rate of 128, respiratory rate of 32, hemoglobin level is 12, and SpO2 is 88. This is the kind of information you might get in a scenario for a question on the CCRN exam. So let's take a look at some of these components. What needs to be optimized in order to improve oxygen delivery? And what assessments do you need to do? Pause the video for a moment. Think about those two questions. And then we'll talk again in a few moments. So what needs to be optimized in order to improve oxygen delivery? Well, let's first of all take a look at that blood pressure. The blood pressure is low. So it's unlikely that we're going to be able to get enough oxygen in the tissues based on that blood pressure. Patients in cardiogenic shock. Okay, if they're in cardiogenic shock, that means we have decreased contractility. So the reason why the blood pressure is low is because of the decreased contractility caused by the cardiogenic shock. Now you can see that the compensatory mechanisms have already started to kick in, and that is an increase in heart rate caused by the sympathetic nervous system, increase in respiratory rate, and that can be caused by sympathetic nervous system too. But if we look at the SpO2, we notice it's 88%. So we have an increase in respiratory rate, probably trying to increase the amount of oxygen in the blood. Okay, now let's go back to the idea we were thinking about earlier with our picture there of the vasculature and our hemodynamics. If the blood pressure is low, if we're in cardiogenic shock, the pump isn't working, our contractility is low, what's going to happen to the blood that's coming to the heart? It's going to back up, right? And our preload is going to increase. Well, if the left side of the heart backs up, where's it going to back up to? The lung. So that increase in respiratory rate and the low SpO2 could be related to fluid backing up into the lung and pulmonary edema. So what assessments do you need to do? We need to do a thorough cardiac assessment and a thorough respiratory assessment. And as we are optimizing oxygen delivery as a whole, we need to be considering all of those different components that were involved in oxygen delivery. That picture that we saw earlier, we need to consider all of those components. Thank you for joining me for this little tidbit here of the CCRN Review. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time, bye now.